to episode three of Coming to Our Senses, the podcast where we try to make sense of sensation. As always, I'm Nick, I'm your host, and I'm excited to talk to you a bit today about the idea of sensation during the pandemic. Um, Last week, we talked a bit about sensory deprivation in horror film, talking about A Quiet Place and Bird Box, which I think provides a nice segue into our conversation today as both horror films and the pandemic have created huge sensory changes for those involved. So today I want to talk a little bit about the changes to our sensation that we've experienced since March 2020 and how they've largely affected how we live our lives. Um, I want to talk about some of those changes in terms of specific ways that touch, taste, smell, etc. have have been influenced by the changes that we've needed to make to the due to COVID and its its rapid spreading, and our reactions as a society to these new sensory situations. So I hope that'll become a little bit more clear and and perhaps fascinating. I'm going to attach a lot of the links that are going to be referenced in this podcast in, in the description of the podcast itself, um, and that way you can access what I'm what I'm re- reading and what I'm interested in. Uh, yourself. So with that said, let's hop in. Now, I want to start by talking about this idea of a sensory revolution. So cultural historian Mark Smith uh, has called the pandemic a sensory revolution. And what he means by that is that there has been this rapid disruption of our sensorial routines and our sensory environments at a scale that we've never really previously encountered as a global society. And furthermore, there's not really clear guidelines for how to cope with both the obvious and the more subtle changes that we've had to make to our everyday lives. The pandemic has affected our ability to perceive the world at the level of our body, so how we you know, smell the, the world, how we feel the world, how we taste the world, but also the environment, the worlds that we inhabit, the places that we move to and through, and in terms of our trajectories, meaning how we uh, uh, plan, what directions we have, what orientation we have towards the world. And so in many ways, at many levels, the pandemic has affected uh, our perception. So what are some of these disruptions? Smith, from the article that he's that I'm referencing where he talks about sensory revolutions mentions a number of these changes and these will probably be more obvious. And remember he's writing at the early end of the or early start of the pandemic, right in the, the first days where there were a lot of really dramatic quick changes as people started to uh, panic or worry about what was happening, the dangers of the virus. So for instance, he talks about the idea of quiet streets. And I remember this very, uh, you know, very specific moment where I woke up in my apartment in Chicago and uh, didn't hear any traffic. And I lived right on North Sheridan Street, which was always full of traffic, people honking, buses passing, ambulances passing. But for a change, the streets were incredibly quiet. Um, Furthermore, I could normally see planes flying over the lake coming into Chicago or leaving Chicago. And during the early weeks of the pandemic, most people chose not to fly, and so the skies were clear in a way that they weren't before. So Smith talks about some of these changes as well. You know, there's more subtle things too, like having to wear a mask, talk around plexiglass that forced us to be louder, right? Or if you had uh, uh, an inkling to go to a grocery store or a restaurant, you might have chosen a different route by getting takeout for getting your groceries delivered. And he talks about how takeout food is normally colder, a little bit less enticing than when you eat at a restaurant. Um, And then the kind of basic everyday interactions we have with other people, the inability to embrace or handshake because of the fear of infection. Um, These very kind of grounded in personal physical contact uh, changes that we, we felt at a dramatic level. So in his article, Smith goes through each of the primary senses, the five senses, and shows how we've had to make changes. And while we are sort of getting back to normal these days, about a year and a half out, we still have really had to embrace these new sensory situations. And some of these changes have become ubiquitous or a sense of a new normal for us. So 
this idea of a sensory revolution is an interesting concept because it forces us to think about all the changes that the pandemic has brought and how it's in, in affecting how we interact with the world and others. And in many ways, these changes haven't been voluntary. We haven't chosen to make these changes. They've been either forced on us or become the more rational choice in terms of what we want to do to protect ourselves, our families, our communities. And they've led to changes in our emotions. They've led to how changes in how we move around town, even how we understand our own sense of time and space. So Smith provides some good examples of these disruptions. I, I want to think about a couple more examples. Um, again, this kind of these the sensory nature of these disruptions means that these are not always dramatic things, but sometimes very quotidian or everyday. And one of the kind of immediate things that a lot of people felt were changes to the rhythms or the routines that they had, you know, going on before the pandemic because of new social distancing, lockdown, quarantine measures. There was a recent psychology study that's noted how everything from schoolwork to daily routines have been changed. And they talk about how these changes happen at two levels. And they say here, quote, primary routines are behaviors necessary for maintaining livelihood and biological needs such as hygiene, sleep, and eating. And secondary routines reflect individual circumstances, motivations, preferences, and exclude and include, excuse me, exercising, leisure, and social activities, and other practices associated with work or study, including keeping oneself on time and meeting goals and targets. And so they talk about primary and secondary routines as being dramatically affected by these measures, by social distancing and lockdown. And you can imagine how this is predominantly a sensory thing, the feelings of waking up having coffee, the feeling of driving to work, the feeling of being on the school bus or being in a classroom. These everyday routines that we feel are no longer part of our daily routine. And so these changes have been you know, immediate and drastic. And I think a year and a half out, we've sort of come to grips with that and have made different arrangements that may be now permanent arrangements. But uh, that's a topic for a little later. Another example of a disruption um, is the danger that the virus creates means that a lot of people are scared of or choose not to um, be in physical proximity with others. And this leads to what's known as touch starvation, the lack of physical connection, the lack of skin to skin contact, um, the lack of hugs, uh, handshakes, and these, you know, the inability to embrace has a lot of psychological and emotional consequences, and they've been exacerbated by Zoom fatigue, the the need to be online all day for work, um, and moving things like, you know, happy hours uh, and other meetings online has meant that we are largely isolated. And for a lot of people, this can mean not seeing anybody all day. And so touch starvation is really probably one of the most profound sensory changes of the pandemic, uh, and one with, I think, we will see emerging consequences uh, for, for a long period to come. Now, the last example that I want to mention um, of these changes, uh, and perhaps a, a very salient one directly related to COVID-19, is something called anosmia, or the loss of smell. And this became a, a quick early symptom that a lot of people recognized of having contracted COVID-19. Um, losing the ability to smell also meant losing the ability to taste for most people, which, as you can imagine, was a dramatic sensory change where now food all tastes the same um, or you can only taste very certain flavors, meaning that there are a lot of frustrations about the kind of losing the happiness or the, the, the pleasures that come with tasting some of your favorite foods, tasting new foods, um, and being able to discern between different food groups, for instance. Now, um, these groupings of changes are not all the changes that have happened at the sensory level due to the pandemic, but you can get a little bit of a taste here of the, the breadth and the depth of the changes that have happened. Um, so what have we done to adjust to these changes, both individually and as a larger community? And this is the part that really fascinates me is, is not only have after a year and a half have we adjusted, but I think we've found ways to better some aspects of our life because of the 
uh, onus or the, the motivation to think about these changes. Um, so I want to go through a couple examples uh, now. And I'll start with the example of soccer. And I've been playing soccer my whole life. Soccer is one of my favorite um, sports, one of my favorite activities. And it, in unique ways, offers some insight into the sensory changes of the pandemic and some of the ways we responded. So uh, if you were like me, you might have been a little disappointed that in the early months of the lockdown, um, the league games uh, for some of our favorite leagues, including the Bundesliga, the uh, English Premier League, the French League, you name it, a lot of the games were shut down, and rightfully so, given the kind of uncertainty of the pandemic and the health risks. Um, but after a couple months, a lot of the seasons resumed, but without fans, and a lot of these clubs often would have tons and tons of fans coming to the game, being a huge part of both the culture and the motivation um, and the profit for, for these games. So while people couldn't attend in person, they wanted to still watch virtually, and so games continued, um, but without fans. And, and, and this created what were known as ghost games, uh, where games were played largely in silence compared to the large number of chanting, uh, uh, cheering, fans yelling at the ref, the, the, the everyday noises that emerge in a stadium were completely missing. And players, coaches, even fans recognize how big of a loss there was. Um, a recent NPR interview talks about how the game, how people responded to these changes to the game. Many leagues began adding recorded sounds of fans chanting to their broadcast and used these sounds to create an atmosphere um, similar but not identical to previous games before the pandemic. And in this NPR interview, they talked to Alexi Lalas, who's a famous American soccer star, about his opinion of this uh, change. And he says, I love it. We all know it's not real, but it's enhancing the viewing experience. And right now, without the crowds, that's all there is. It's the television viewing experience. So you can see here that the change that had to happen was obviously a move to an audiovisual medium only, of being able to stream the games but not being able to be there in person. But people found ways to, in a sense, recreate the game as we know it by creating the sound of fans there to create the game. And as a viewer myself, I think this did help. It was a little odd listening to the silence of fans cheering. Now, uh, a similar example, still from soccer, was how the U.S. men's national team used certain robots to create the game day experience uh, while fans couldn't attend in person. The U.S. men's national team, for instance, partnered with Volkswagen to develop a robot that would allow children to uh, attend games who were unable to physically for different reasons. Maybe they were immunocompromised. Uh, or they they couldn't move out of their, their hospital beds or their rooms. And so the uh, robot purpose was to stream the game uh, from the field, from a little camera attached to the robot, um, so that the children could watch from a distance but still be on the field with players. Um, the Volkswagen partnership with the U.S. men's national team released a statement that said, the custom robot was developed to expand the reach, visibility, and impact of U.S. soccer's existing player on a program where 11 children have an opportunity to walk out on the field with the women's and men's national team players during the playing of the national anthem. Champ, which is the name of the robot, will take the place of a physical player on a and with its telepresent technology, allow young soccer fans experiencing hardship or unique circumstances the opportunity to participate virtually providing mobility and access to special match day experiences. So, you know, this is an interesting concept and one that perhaps uh, in practice looks a little bit different than it does uh, in their statement or their press release. But uh, the idea that children can attend at a distance still through the audiovisual effect of being on the field is an interesting response to uh, an issue that probably existed before the pandemic, but became pretty emergent or at least aware uh, uh, during the pandemic because of the pandemic. Um, so soccer provides an interesting example and, and one that I think may resonate with a lot of people. Uh, in another vein, though, many Muslim migrants in Minneapolis, Minnesota, 
couldn't leave their homes and attend mosque services during the summer holiday of Ramadan, which fell during the pandemic. Um, and for the first time in the city's history, mosques were given permission to play the call to prayer, which was central to the celebration of Ramadan, um, over loudspeakers throughout the town throughout the month. And this was the first time that they were able to do so. And it was a big deal because there are a lot of Muslim migrants in Minneapolis, predominantly from uh, Somalia, but also from around uh, the Middle East and, and Africa. And the broadcasting of this sound of the call to prayer um, was a parallel with how um, the call to prayer is played in um, home communities in Muslim majority countries and in home countries for a lot of the migrants. Um, a, mini a Minnesota public radio interview um, talked to uh, uh, a, a member of the CARE Minnesota program, um, Jailani Hussein, who said, the call to prayer will be especially meaningful to the many senior citizens of Cedar Riverside neighborhood who have been isolated due to the pandemic. It will help them feel more connected to their community and mosque in this sacred month. And you can see here how the soundscape or the broadcasting of the call to prayer throughout the neighborhood uh, was a form of care and a form of uh, comfort during what were particularly difficult times. So like soccer, the use of sound here was a particularly powerful form of connection. Um, this next example is probably resonant to many different fields of life, but as offices and uh, different schools around the country quickly tried to move to remote options, the idea of co-worker solidarity began to dwindle. And there's a lot of interesting studies about how connections that office uh, uh, workers have oftentimes emerge around informal moments. So what are called the water cooler moments, right? The casual uh, meetings, the casual hangouts, casual game nights. Um, that uh, workers normally participate in, either in person in the office or in their own personal times. But those informal meetings really disappeared as workers had to join conference calls and therefore didn't have as much motivation to meet at other points. And there wasn't really an option to talk informally over Zoom when meeting information was, was the you know, dominant form of that conversation. So the idea of moving water cooler moments online, uh, followed by using Zoom to schedule informal meetings, informal hangouts, and game nights to compensate for some of the casual moments. But you can imagine, like many other fields, that Zoom fatigue here still plays a role, and for a lot of people, the inability to connect um, in person to be in the same space was really difficult and, and was not replicated over Zoom entirely. Um, another example, moving on here, one of my favorite stories is that, like we talked about, the prevalence of touch starvation or missing those informal, in-person hugs, handshakes, etc., um, were really a pressing issue as tactile encounters with friends and families were, un were no largely limited given the uncertainties um, uh, about the safety of frequent contact um, given the virus itself and the way that the airborne nature of its spreading. Now, in response, some families set up what they called hugging stations where pairs could embrace through hanging plastic sheets that eliminated the risk of contacting the virus. My own family um, mentioned that uh, they had an opportunity to hug my grandmother who um, you know, was a larger risk because of her age by hanging up a shower curtain um, and giving hugs through the plastic. And she noted that while it wasn't the same, it was really needed given that she hadn't been able to hug people for months uh, because of the caution and the inaccessibility of the vaccine in the early months of the pandemic. So uh, these kind of readjustments can be really dramatic because they allow for some of the holding on to the emotions of previous times while also uh, living in the moment and thinking about potential futures. Um, another example here is the virtual concert. Maybe you've attended one. Uh, the moving of 
what are large venues, often large concert venues where tons of people fill into theaters uh, around the country, are often, you know, spreaders of many diseases, but this time uh, uh, corona being, uh, you know, the more dangerous one. So concerts had to find alternatives, and many musicians turned to streaming their concerts online, providing a sense of comfort and connection um, during times that obviously were uncertain. And this was similar with other other cultural practices like eating. In my own research, I've looked at people moving to Zoom dining, doing some happy hours, birthdays, holiday celebrations with each other over Zoom or over WhatsApp or Skype, but using uh, having food to accompany the meal. So they get the sensory component of eating and tasting and smelling while also audiovisually connecting over online or digital infrastructure uh, with with friends and family. Um, this was also mirrored by other practices as people were starting to gather new interests, new hobbies because of either new free time or desire to, you know, fill the void of not being able to see others. And one of the the pressing or at least interesting uh, consequences of this where people started buying more pets or adopting more pets. Um, there are some interesting interviews with the owners or of, of different uh, breeding companies or, or different shelters that said that there was an increased demand almost twofold during the early months of the pandemic as people were trying to get uh, pets. And so one of these interviews um, uh, uh, by the Washington Post, uh, the author says, Americans kept trying to fill voids with canine companions, either because they were stuck working from home with children who needed something to do, or they had no work and lots of free time or felt lonely with no way to socialize. And here pets could somewhat help to fill the void. Now, the final example I have here, and the one that I kind of want to uh, think a little bit more about too, is the ways that the pandemic changed how we became consumers. And my partner and I have watched a lot of series since the beginning of the pandemic. And on different services, I've gotten many commercials that are very specifically related to the pandemic and how we've had to adjust. There was a Snickers commercial where um, the husband of a couple is waiting to meet the friends for dinner uh, for a dinner party, but he's in his underwear and a dress shirt, and the couple is there in person, and he realizes that they're not doing a Zoom dinner, and I think it's quite a humorous use of that in-person, online uh, relationship that we had with with connection with, with our friends and family during the early months of the pandemic. Um, there was another commercial, and one for the internet company Xfinity, that came out around the holidays. And it begins with a shot of a fretting Santa Claus, who's played by Steve Carell in the commercial, video calling with a group of elves and explaining that, quote, after the year we've just had, the Christmas gifts need to be extra special. So the elves begin to ponder what gifts will make Santa's criteria, but find themselves stumped until a snowball fight sparks a moment of inspiration. And here are the elves uh, decide that they will gift togetherness. And this is an interesting concept because what I think people felt was missing was this sense of togetherness, which was largely intangible, but the commercial makes it uh, somewhat tangible. So the elves begin frantically packaging the holiday spirit into boxes labeled the smell of grandma's cooking, auntie's cheek squeezes, grandpa's same old stories, um, a furry friend, a family snowball fight. And ironically, these match up with some of the other examples I've already talked about, but they, uh, again, get at this idea of the intangible nature of what togetherness is, but found in these very small moments. With the gifts packed into the sled, into the sleigh, excuse me, um, Santa takes off into the night and uses his video phone uh, call technology to tell the elves, thank you for believing in the holidays, right? And so this commercial uh, and its tagline, which is togetherness, the greatest gift of all, captures the essence of this ongoing psychological stress of social distancing 
while recentering and in a, to a degree marketing the new possibilities for connecting uh, and be, you know, maintaining community. So along with a number of other advertisers, Xfinity makes physical separation and video calling uh, seem like a new normal, seem like a, a ubiquitous, um, recognizable, and even laughable form of communication. We forget um, to unmute our microphones, we video call without our pants on, we pause when we're working out or showering, uh, or cooking or taking a nap to, to receive a call. Um, and companies are really taking stock of this new infrastructure for interpersonal interaction and making this the way that we're making these adjustments that ha uh, in response to the pandemic since March of 2020. So I think this commercial, along with a number of other commercials that I'm sure you've seen, are trying to capitalize on some of these changes and um, are, uh, uh, in a sense, trying to sell back to us that, that exact idea of connection through whatever, whatever product they're selling. And Xfinity is an interesting one because it's for internet, which I think also played a central role in how we adjusted to the sensory changes. So in conclusion, to sum up, the pandemic has really presented the world with a sensory revolution, as we've talked about. It's a dramatic change to how we perceive the world and how we interact with each other. Yet, as humans, we've found so many creative ways to reimagine our relationship to the sensory environment, to our bodies, to our trajectories, to the larger sensory world. Um, and I've only been able to mention a few of these examples here. I'm sure you can think of many more. But they're testament to our collective creativity and our steadfast nature to maintain uh, a sense of community, a sense of connection in what are really uh, trying times and will be continue to be trying times for the foreseeable future. So with that, I'll end our podcast for today. Um, I hope that these ideas have sparked some curiosity to look into the senses, to try to make sense of the senses. Um, and uh, I hope you'll tune in next week when we'll be talking about one of my favorite topics, migration and the senses. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to talking with you again then. So thanks for listening, and until next time.